Tell someone, all the enemies who have seen up to this night, you will never see them again. Yeah. What a mighty God! What a mighty God! We serve. of this we worship you thank you father Who? daddy asked me to tell someone you came here tonight saying when will God remember me he asked me to tell you yes I will remember you tonight. <laughs> Unchangeable changer, we worship you. King of glory, we bow before you. The one who can do all things, we all lie before you prostrate tonight. In your own miraculous way, that which no man can do. Please do it for us. Yeah. Let no one live here without a testimony. Yeah. Just glorify your holy name. Yeah. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, let someone shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
want you to shake hands with one or two people. Tell them, neighbor, I love you. But tonight, my miracle will be bigger than yours. Tell the fellow on the other side. Neighbor, I love you. But tonight, my miracle will be bigger than yours. Thank you. If you believe that, shout a really, really big hallelujah. I'm sure nobody is uh, asking what's going on. Is he going to sit down? <laughs> I'm already seated. <laughs> and in case you think that that, sh that should not be the way it should be, all you need to do is read Luke chapter 5, from verse 1 to 7. When Jesus entered into the boat of Peter, he sat down. <laughs> He sat down to teach, and the congregation was standing. So I'm the one doing the right thing now. But I give you permission to sit. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Let's give the choir a really shout, big shout. They've done very well during this convention. I thank God for them. I thank God for all those who have ministered to us in music. They've all done extremely well. And God will bless you all. My, oh my. I was listening to those young ones who are preaching from my prayer room. And uh, I was practically dancing for joy. Like somebody said, the redeemed Christian Church of God has a glorious future. I've said it, that a day is coming when this children minister, I'll just come, pronounce a blessing on you, and we'll go home. They are doing very well. Very well. I mean, you listen to this so-called televangelist. At the end of one hour, you ask yourself, what has he said? And you see these children talking for 15 minutes, and we are loaded. Come on, give the Lord a big round of applause. Glory be to God. Well, let's, let's get to action. Genesis chapter 1, from verse 26 to 31. I had to look for a special passage that I know they won't think of. <laughs> I saw many of them quoting Isaiah. They thought that is where I will go. <laughs> That's why I came to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26 to 31. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, 
and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree, and in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Oh, thank you, Father. There was a dawn when God created animals. There was a dawn when he created birds. There was a dawn when he created fish, etc., etc. But then there is a dawn specifically for you. Just before God rested, he made you. Your dawn came loaded. Loaded with oh, so many things. I'm going to be very brief tonight because the, my children have done everything. They've have had all manners of definition, definition of new, definition of done. I've had dictionary definition. I've had definition that is not from the dictionary. Oh, God. They even gave us computer definition. <laughs> The first thing God said to man when the dawn for man came is be blessed. So your dawn of blessings has come. And Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, Proverbs 10, 22 says, The blessings of the Lord make it rich. I added no sorrow. Because your dawn has come with a divine blessing, it follows that for the rest of your life, poverty is no more. Because the blessings of the Lord make it rich and has no sorrow, it follows in the song that we sang together. And by the way, that song the day I've been waiting for has come, was given to me more than two years ago. But it was meant for tonight. <laughs> because God spoke to someone here, at least, that you are blessed, and his blessing makes rich Amen. and has no sorrow. Amen. I can say from the word of God now, for the rest of your life, no more sorrow. Amen. In third John verse two, third John verse two, God said, I wish above all things that you prosper. 
And people call some preachers prosperity preachers. I am not one of them. Anybody who wants to be sincere will call me a holiness preacher. But holiness is the master key to prosperity. You cannot be holy and die poor. It's not possible. I wish above all things, according to law of priority, the first thing God wants is that you will prosper and be a help. Just make sure your soul is prospering. And the beauty of this all is that once God has blessed you, no one can reverse the blessing. Numbers 23, verse 19 to 20. Numbers 23, 19 to 20. It says clearly, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Once he has spoken, it's already done. And that prophet said, God has given me a commandment to bless. I have blessed and I cannot reverse it. I'm saying to all of you who are listening to me here tonight and those who are following us all over the world, in the name that's above every other name, be blessed. Yeah. Oh yes, I know that some blessings are conditional. Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3, Genesis 12 from verse 1 to 3, God gave seven blessings to Abraham based on three conditions. You can read it for yourself. But then there are certain blessings that are irreversible. In Genesis 22, you can read it from verse 1 to 18. Genesis 22 from verse 1 to 18. After God gave a little test to Abraham about giving God his first fruit sacrifice, and he passed the test, God said, by myself have I sworn. God never had to swear because he speaks and he's done. But he said to Abraham, I swear, in blessing, I will bless you. And when you read Genesis 27, from verse 30 to 33, Genesis 27, 30 to 33, the Bible says, just after Isaac has blessed Jacob, as he was getting out of the room, Esau came. And when the father discovered that, ah, the fellow I wanted to bless is the one just coming, he said something to Esau. He said, sorry, I've blessed him, and he shall be blessed. In the name of the one who sent me to you, in the name of the one who has made me your dad, you are blessed. Yeah. I know even the father's blessings requires some things. I mean, you read Genesis 27 from verse 1 to the end where he called Esau, go and get me some bush meat, prepare the kind of food I like, so I can bless you from the bottom of my heart. I have to do something to provoke a father's blessing. 
I mean, I've told you the story of a time I was traveling, I was in Heathrow. Those days, I was traveling economy, and they will weigh your bag. If you are traveling economy, there's a limit to what you can carry. So all the heavy things that I wanted to carry, I put in carry-on. Because they, they don't weigh carry-on. The books, the tapes, everything I put in two carry-on. I checked in the lighter ones. And then as I was struggling with my two carry-ons, and, and a carry-on can be heavier than a suitcase, <laughs> I saw two of my children coming, two boys. Ah, Daddy, good morning. I said, good morning. And then one of them ran at me and grabbed the two carry-ons, which were very heavy. So I turned to him. I said, God bless you. And the second said, Daddy, you didn't say God bless me. I said, for what? <laughs> you greeted me, I greeted you. He helped me, so he got a blessing. I know you, in this nation, you live on credit. So I bless you on credit. <laughs> when your dad blesses you, you are blessed. I told you this story. I'm sitting down tonight because I'm not in a hurry. Are you in a hurry? <laughs> because we don't know when we shall meet again. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's get as much from God tonight as we can. I said I went to minister in a place in Ikoyi, that's the top place among the big ones. And there was this young man, I do, I, up to today, I don't know how he managed to get into that group because it's for the higher mighty. And I gave my lecture. When I finished, he came to me. I said, ah, I've never heard anybody preach like this before. He said, well, all I have in my purse, I want to give you. And he gave me an envelope of $10,000. So I said to him, ah, God bless you. Next time will be more. He left my presence very angry. What kind of greedy pastor is this? I give you $10,000 and you are saying next time will be more. He didn't understand. But the following year he came back. Because that year when he came to that meeting, he had only 10 gas stations. He was a small boy compared to the others. I'm sure if you have 10 gas stations, <laughs> you will consider yourself big. He came back and said, last year when you said, next time will be more. I didn't understand what you were saying. He said, now I have 110 gas stations. And so I've brought something that is more. Uh, you want to know how much he brought? None of your business. <laughs> but when he gave me that and I said, oh, God bless you, next time will be more, he shouted, Amen. Amen. So God bless you. <laughs> your new dawn starts with divine blessing. God bless them. And then God turned to them and said, be fruitful. Your new dawn. 
is a dawn that will put an end to barrenness. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 26, Exodus 23, verse 26, God made a promise. He said, there shall be none barren among my people. It doesn't matter what the doctor said, because we came tonight, nine months from now, you will be carrying your baby. Yeah. It doesn't matter how old you are. Because in Genesis chapter 18, from verse 9 to 14, Genesis 18, 9 to 14, when God paid a visit to Abraham, and he said to Sarah, in nine months' time, you will have a baby. Sarah laughed because she was 90 years old. And uh, in Romans chapter 4, from verse 17 to 21, Romans 4, 17 to 21, the Bible says the womb of Sarah was already dead. But like the testimony you had tonight, God has the power to reverse the irreversible. And by the way, I want to thank the Almighty God for that testimony. Because when I heard in Israel that there was a, a child with irreversible stroke in the brain, uh, I said in my spirit, the devil is a liar. But if God that I serve is still on his throne, the irreversible has to be reversed. Amen. May I decree to somebody here tonight, everything that the enemy has called irreversible in your life shall be reversed tonight. No more barrenness for you. No more fruitless efforts. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. Jeremiah 32, verse 27. The Almighty God said, Behold, I'm the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? I have a God who can never fail. It's not going to start failing with your case. Yeah. A woman was giving a testimony at a festival of life in London. It was, she was carrying a baby. And you know, we are so used to miracles. So miracles don't uh, excite us anymore. May God forgive us. She was giving a, mirror, a testimony, carrying a baby, just one baby. Is that a miracle? We've seen two, we've seen three, we've seen four. But then she said, my husband and I have been married for 36 years. And now I am 60, so either 63 or 64 years old. I stopped menstruating a long time ago. But then the word of God came in one of the uh, Holy Ghost services that God is going to reverse the irreversible. Hey, this is the sign. Next convention, you will come with your own sign. So God started your new dawn by saying, you are blessed. Yeah. And then he went on to say, be fruitful. Yeah. And then he went on further to say, multiply. Yeah. So your new dawn includes the beginning of multiplication.
Thank you, Father. The Lord asked me to tell someone. He said, those who are harassing you we soon have enough problems of their own. They won't even remember you. You know, one of the things that makes me so happy, whenever we have Holy Ghost Nights or Festival of Life or whatever you choose to call it, is the way God speaks so accurately. And some funny people will say, uh, we are faking miracles. There was a huge crowd. This lady was not even about to make the meeting. You had the testimony. How will I know what was wrong with her? She came in, she was just coming, and God said, Oh, there's someone there. Tell that fellow the bleeding has stopped. Only God, who knows all things. And that God is the one who is asking me to tell you, you are blessed. Multiplication. Multiplication, as everybody knows, is far, far more powerful than addition. If I say 2 plus 10, that will be 12. But if I say 2 times 10, that's already 20. 10 plus 10 will only be 20. 10 times 10 is going to be 100. That tells you that in your blessing is rapid progress. In Genesis chapter 24, from verse 12 to 14, Genesis 26 rather, Genesis 26 from verse 12 to 14, the Bible says Isaac sowed in the land and in the same year, he had a hundredfold returns. But God says in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 11, Deuteronomy 1, verse 11, that it is possible for God to multiply you a thousandfold. When you go through the scriptures, you will see what happened. That in Genesis chapter 21, from verse 1 to 7, Genesis 21 from verse 1 to 7, Abraham and Sarah had one son, Isaac. By the time you get to Genesis 25, from verse 21 to 26, Genesis 25, 21 to 26, Isaac gave birth to a set of twins. By the time you get to Genesis 37 from verse 1 to 11, Genesis 37 from verse 1 to 11, one of the twins gave birth to 12 brothers. By the time you get to Genesis 46 verse 27, Genesis 46 verse 27, the 12 brothers, when they finally settled in Egypt, they had become 70. By the time you get to Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, Exodus 12, verse 37, the number had increased to 600,000 men without counting children, multiplication. In the name of the one who can multiply. I decree to every one of you, rapid promotion begins. <laughs> and let me decree throughout CCG 
in Canada. That by the next time I come, ministers alone will fill this place. There's a funny story of a friend of mine. He, he has some problems, was under bondage of the enemy, highly qualified, but he was single until, you know, well over 50. Because he just, he was the principal of a school, but he just couldn't open his mouth to say to a lady, uh, how now will you marry me? I mean, there were very beautiful ladies who were teachers in the school under him. And on many occasions, he would ask one of them, come and see me in the office. And that one would be rejoicing. Uh, principal is about to propose. And when he's together, uh, hey, uh, oh, I asked you to come and see me. Uh, what about that exercise book? And so many people thought that he was important. Then we went there to hold a program like this. And he gave his life to Jesus and the tide turned. So within six months, he got married. Nine months after marriage, the wife gave birth to a set of twins. Two years after that, another set of twins. And so I had to say to him, Gently, gently. <laughs> that kind of blessing that you will be saying to God, Almighty God, gently, gently, <laughs> receive it in Jesus' name. So your new dawn is loaded with divine blessing. It's loaded with fruitfulness, loaded with multiplication. But it didn't end there. It's also loaded with restoration. Because God then went forward and said, replenish the earth. To replenish means restore. When we talk about restoration, it means that it could mean that there had been fullness, but now there's emptiness. It could mean that things were well before, but they are no longer well. It could mean that you've suffered some serious losses. It could mean that somebody had duped you it could mean that somebody has, I mean, some forces have stolen certain things from you. To replenish means to restore. When you, when you look at Mark chapter 8, from verse 22 to 25, Mark 8, 22, thank you, Father. The Lord asked me to tell someone, he said, that fellow will understand. Daddy asked me to tell you, you will bounce back. Yeah. <laughs> well, Daddy says somebody's getting a brand new bladder. continue because he's talking. And I want to say amen to this one before I tell you. The Lord said, there's someone here tonight. He said, greatness is in your destiny. And you shall be great.
In Mark chapter 8, from verse 22 to 25, Mark 8, 22 to 25, the Bible spoke of a man who was blind, and they brought him to Jesus. You know, you know, you know the story. Jesus spat on his eyes, touched him, and said, yes, how do you see now? And the man said, I can see men like trees. I mean, that man wasn't born blind. He has seen trees before. He has seen men before. He used to see, but he became blind. And you remember, Jesus gave him a second touch, and then he began to see clearly. I pray for someone here tonight. Whatever that was good that you lost, Tonight, my father will restore. In John chapter 11, John chapter 11, from verse 39 to 44, John 11, 39 to 44, you remember the story of Lazarus? He's been dead and buried four days by the one who can restore brought him back to life. And like I've always explained, when a man had been dead for four days, by then he's already beginning to rot. To rot means the blood that was red has become blackish water. Worms have already started eating part of the body. But when God says, Lazarus, come forth, whatever worms had eaten, they vomited. The flesh that was already changing to water has become back to flesh. The blood that was already darkish water changed, changed back to red blood. It doesn't matter how long that the enemy has swallowed something precious to you. Tonight, the enemy will vomit it. I had a testimony of one of my boys tonight that he had a case running for two years and then God settled the case and give him compensation in addition. That's my God. There was a sister years ago. She was sacked in her place of work because she refused to compromise. Because the company was big. They made sure because she sued them and the company began to settle the judge. Just keep on postponing the case. And the case was postponed for 17 years. Then she came to the Holy Ghost service like this and God spoke. This God is wonderful. The crowd is, a, <laughs> the crowd in Nigeria is a little more than this one. <laughs> Maybe all of you put together will be like the mass choir. <laughs> but in that massive crowd, God spoke and said, there's someone here, they'll be postponing your case again and again, adjourning your case. Next week, it's another meeting time and there will be no adjournment. She jumped for joy. She knew that must be her. Following week, she went to court as usual, and the lawyer of the company said, my Lord, I want to beg for an adjournment. The judge says, no more adjournment. I'm declaring, I'm, I'm judging now, right here. She didn't even go to the room to write any judgment. She wrote it there. 
My judgment is, you sack this woman wrongly, you will pay her everything you should have paid her for the past 17 years, <laughs> plus interest. I decree everything the devil has taken from you will be restored with interest. And then your new dawn was also loaded with the word subdue. Replenish the earth, subdue it. To subdue actually means have dominion. Be in charge. If we want to know what that one means, you just take the example of Joseph. In Genesis 39 from verse 1 to 6, Genesis 39, 1 to 6, he was brought into Potiphar's house as a slave. By the time God finished with him there, the Bible says he was in control. Finished with him there, the Bible says he was in control. Even the owner of the house didn't know what was going on. It's whatever Joseph gave him that yet. That's been in control. You know the rest of the story? The wife lied against him. They threw him to prison. And then you read Genesis 39. Genesis 39 from verse 20 to 23. In prison, the jailer handed everything over to him. Somebody said, Prison can be bad if you are the one in charge of food. <laughs> Joseph was in charge of everything. And you know, when he left from there, he ended up on the throne of Egypt. And Pharaoh said, nobody would lift up hand or foot except at your command. You can read it in Genesis 41. Read the whole chapter. That is being in control. And you know what? According to Philippians chapter 2, from verse 9 to 11, Philippians 2, 9 to 11, you have in your hand the ability to control. Because at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee must bow. All you need is the name of Jesus Christ. In your new dawn is the ability to control sickness, to control demons. Because it is written in Mark chapter 16 from verse 17 to 18, Mark 16, 17 to 18, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they cast out demons. They lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You have the name of Jesus Christ. So you should be in dominion. You should be unstoppable now. Because if you read Acts chapter 5 from verse 17 to 29, Acts 5, 17 to 29, they put Peter and his colleagues in prison. And at night, the angel of the Lord came and loosed them and said, hey, keep on preaching. Then in Acts chapter 12, from verse 1 to 24, Acts 12, from verse 1 to 24, Peter again was captured, put in prison, the king said, uh, oh, I killed one of you. You will be the next to go. You, you know the rest of the story. By the time they came the following morning, they discovered that the board has flown again. You know, I have good news for somebody. Anyone who tries to stop your progress now is heading for the grave. Yeah. I've 
told you the story before of one young man. I don't know where he went to, but he came back home loaded with demons. He was so loaded with demons that uh, he couldn't sit down. He couldn't stand. All he could do was lie on the ground. He couldn't go to the toilet. He couldn't go to the bathroom. The demons just took him over completely. He became like a vegetable. And they carried him to the headquarters several years ago. Told me the story. Well, so I, I said to him, I command you to kneel down because I want to pray for you. He said, I can't kneel. I said, I command you. He said, in whose name? Oh, I said, in the name of Jesus. He said, ah, that is different. So he got up and knelt down. And then I prayed a simple prayer. And I said, I command you to stand and go home. He said, I can't stand. I said, I command you to stand. He said, in whose name? I said, in the name of Jesus. He said, that's different. So he stood up. I said, I command you now to go home, take your bath, and get back to work. This time, I didn't wait for him. I added, in the name of Jesus. And he, <laughs> he smiled. And that was the end of his problem. Tonight I command, in the name of Jesus, stand up. Begin to make progress. Stand up. Be completely whole. Shout for joy. Give the Lord a big round of applause. <laughs> Glory be to God. Please be seated. And then your new dawn suddenly showed that God moved from good to very good. Because if we begin from verse 1 of Genesis, after God moved the first day and he said, let there be light, the Bible said God saw light that it was good. Moved on to the second day, created what he wanted to create, when he finished, he said, God looked at everything and said, behold, it was good. Third day, it was good. Fourth day, it was good. Fifth day, it was good. When he came to your case, he said, behold, it was very good. It doesn't matter how good things are for you now. In the mighty name of the one who is called the light, things will soon become very good. You know, when you read 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 19 to 21, The Lord said, there's someone here who used to operate under heavy anointing. Then you fell. The Lord asked me to tell you, restitute your ways, and I will double your anointing. Yeah. Mm. I didn't expect anybody to say amen because... Uh, <laughs> There's a little secret there of somebody who fell. But when you read 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 19 to 21, you find the story of Elisha. 
He was a wealthy man, the son of a very wealthy farmer. His future was great. Because when the father died, he was going to take over. But then he left everything and became the servant of Elijah, a prophet who didn't even have a fixed address. But then when you follow him, by the time you get to 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4 from verse 8 to 17, when the great woman of Shunem asked him to come and eat in her house, Elisha told him, I don't need your food. The Bible said the woman was stubborn. She compelled him to come and eat. So he, he went in, ate, tasted the food and said, ah, this is not bad. And started coming back again and again. <laughs> and the woman finally said, let's build a house for him so it won't be an occasional lunch. But when one day the Spirit of God said, you'll be eating this woman's food, what are you going to do for her in return? Listen to what Elisha said. You want me to introduce you to the king? Or you want me to introduce you to the commander in chief? Etc., etc. The man who was a rich farmer had become a man so influential that kings obey him. He had moved from good to very good. I have good news for someone here tonight, even before the end of this month, things will have changed for the better. You know, many of you know a little bit about me. You know, my father was so poor, poor people called him poor. Uh, his own poverty was poverty squared. But then God decided to pick the son of someone that his colleagues said can never build a house and began to change things. When I became a senior lecturer in the university, when I became an acting head of department, uh, if anybody saw me then uh, and they asked me, how is life? I would say, good man. <laughs> but God can move you from good to very good. i just give you one illustration. When people look at someone who has no need for anything. And yet they want to show appreciation. That's when they give him a honorary degree. They don't give honorary doctorate degree to a hungry farmer. Mm -mm. It's when they look at you and they feel, all right, he doesn't need anything. Let's honor him with a doctorate degree. I will want you to go and do your search. All you need to do is ask Google how many people have one honorary doctorate degree in the world. Google will tell you. Then ask how many have two? And the number will drop drastically. Find out how many people have three honorary doctorate degrees the number will become almost embarrassingly small. So when your daddy had seven, he decided that's, that's enough. After all, seven is a perfect number. 
And then all of a sudden, I got a letter from Great or a Robot University. And they said, sir, we've decided to give you an honorary doctorate degree. Ah. I, said, I wanted to say I don't want, politely. So they said they will they'd be doing graduation at such and such a time. Please come. I wrote back, I'm sorry I can't come. Because, well, which was true. I was already occupied. And then they, they chose another date and said, I'm still sorry, my calendar is full. And then they said, we will bring it to you. <laughs> Go ahead, shout hallelujah. So they brought it to Nigeria. God who can pick nobody and turn him to someone who can say, I don't want any more honorary degree, and they say, we will bring it to you. That someone is here tonight. Inside your new dawn is that ability to move from good to very good. May I prophesy to someone here tonight who thinks it's big? In the name that's above every other name, before the end of this year, you will know right now you are small. <laughs> that you have just started to begin to be big. I think God will want me to tell you this so that you know where you're headed. I was preaching on degrees of prosperity some years ago. And I gave the illustration of people who are, that you could call, wealthy. And when you see a man who is wealthy, he doesn't think before he buys anything he wants. He has money. And so I gave the example of people who ride in Rolls Royce. But then I told them that there's something more than wealthy, something called prosperous. And I told them the story of a man who went on a money walk in London with a few bodyguards going with him. And as he was jogging, he saw a factory, big factory. But like all factories, this factory was dirty. And he said, well, which factory is that? They said, oh, that's where they make Rolls Royce. He said, what? Where they make my car? Is this dirty? So he branched. And he said he wanted to see the owner. And the owner said, yes. What can I do for you? He said, I want to buy the factory. And the owner said, it's not for sale. Who told you? I mean, I mean the money I make every year from producing Rolls Royce. I mean, you, you have a rough idea how much a Rolls Royce will cost. He said, I will make you an offer you cannot refuse. Finally, he asked the man to tell him, tell me, how much do you make in 10 years? I will pay you right now. So a man went on a walk, came back, the owner of a factory for making Rolls Royce. And that's called Prosperous. So when you compare that to somebody who owns just one Rolls Royce, <laughs> that one who owns just one Rolls Royce, is a small boy. But there's something greater than Prosperous. 
The Bible calls it flourishing. And I gave them an illustration that some years ago, the wife of one emir of one nation, I won't mention names because this is going around the world now, came to London to shop. And the biggest shop in the whole world is called Harrods. <laughs> In Harrods, you can find a pen that is more costly than the house you are living in. Mm. So people like me go there for sightseeing. <laughs> Only for sightseeing. This, daughter, this wife of Anema came to that place, shopped for three days. At the end of three days, he told one of her servants to go charter a plane, I mean, go get a plane and take my goose home. That one said, ah, okay, I, I will go and charter uh, a cargo plane. She said, you go and charter a dirty cargo plane to take my goose home. Go and buy a 747 remove all the seats and use it to carry my goose home. That man did that. And do you know that when they got home and they loaded the thing into a big warehouse, she didn't even open any of the gifts, any of the things she bought for three years. So she went shopping just out of boredom. That's what is called flourishing. There is somebody here tonight. By the time God finishes with you, you'll be in the category of those who are flourishing. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Inside your new dawn is from good to very good. But then, and I will be running off very soon now because I believe God has already blessed the one he wants to bless. Amen. Let's look at this thing from the spiritual perspective. Spiritually speaking, when God says, be fruitful, it's not just talking about you having babies. That one is already settled. It's not talking about those of you, I mean, those of you who have been walking like an elephant and eating like a rat, that the tide is about to turn. It's talking about you winning souls. Because in John 15, verse 16, Thank you, Father. I can hear somebody singing. And the song is, He has done it for me. He has done it for me. He has done it for me. What my father cannot do. <laughs> I don't know who that fellow is, but you are going to sing that song before the end of this month. When he says be fruitful, he says win souls. In John 15, 16, he said, you've not chosen me, I've chosen you that you go and bear fruits. It's not everybody who heard about this meeting who came tonight. God chose you to come because he has a special interest in you. 
He wants you to go and be fruitful. He wants you to multiply. In Matthew 28 from verse 18 to 20, Matthew 28 from verse 18 to 20, he wants you to make disciples. He wants you to reproduce yourself. He wants you to begin to teach whatever you have learned. Like in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul told Timothy, what you've learned from me, teach others. So that they too can go ahead and teach others. That's what he means by multiply. When he says replenish, restore, he's asking you to go after backsliders. All your friends that you used to know that were members of the redeemed Christian Church of God or were Christians and they are backsliding, you must not rest. You must go and bring them back. God wants you to restore. In the book of Jude, the only chapter of Jude, verses 22 and 23, Jude, verses 22 and 23, have compassion on these people. You know where they are going. If they are backsliding, they are going to hell. You have a minister who used to be your friend, who was operating under the umbrella of the covenant of the redeemed peace and church of God, and you know it, that it is this covenant that has turned our church to what it has become. And the fellow now is being deceived by Satan to move away, go after him replenish, restore. And when the Almighty God says, subdue, have dominion, ah, in Acts chapter 13, from verse 5 to 12, Acts 13 from verse 5 to 12, he's expecting you to use the power that is released to you tonight to confront forces of darkness to show the devil you can't operate where I'm operating. God expects that by the next time you step into your office, you will go into that office blasting tongues, Amen. decreeing that darkness and light cannot live together, that anybody in this office that is not going to yield, that's not going to surrender their life to Jesus Christ, I give you notice, and for as long as I'm here, you will not feel comfortable here. He expects you to take authority, to have dominion. Ah. I'm about to close. <laughs> I've jumped one or two things, but uh, the Holy Spirit will feel the gap. We come to the conclusion. And the conclusion is your new dawn can begin now. It's in your hand. God has done everything he's going to do to give you a brand new dawn. He chose the theme for this convention out of many topics that we could have used. He sent a man who is over 80 years old to travel almost 12 hours in the plane so that he can bring you this message. God has done his best. Thank you, Father. The Lord asked me to tell someone 
that you will enjoy peace for a long time. Your new dawn can begin right now. But the choice is yours. Do you want it right now? You see, because you cannot resist the devil if you don't submit to God first. The word of God says clearly, submit yourself unto God. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. Like I said, whether two days or so ago, here, the sun will be shining bright outside. You can be inside here, all doors locked, all windows shut, light out, and this place will be total darkness. Unless you open the door, the light will not be able to shine in. I'm appealing to those of you who have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. He said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Revelation 3, 20, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door to me, he said, I will come in. The light of the world wants to come into your life, wants to come into your soul, he wants to give you a brand new beginning, a new dawn. But you know what? He will not force you. Unless you open the door to him voluntarily, he won't come in. If he's that mighty, why doesn't he kick open the door like somebody has? Because he's not an arm robber. He's a gentleman. He will knock. If you open to him, he will come. But if he keeps knocking and you refuse to open, after a while, he will go away. And once he goes away, you are on your own. So if you are here and you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, Come and do so now. But I won't deceive you. If you open the door of your life to him and he comes in, he will not come in and become your tenant. If he comes into your life, he will become your landlord. Once he comes into your life, whatever he says is what you must do. So if you know you don't want him to become your Lord, don't ask him to be your savior. But if he's not your savior, if the light of the world does not come into your life, darkness will be reigning supreme in your life. And you know what? Everything that is evil belongs to darkness. Failure, Defeat, sorrow, retrogression, all manners of evil, they all belong to darkness. So I'm appealing to you, be wise. Say bye-bye to the devil. Bye-bye to all his works of darkness. Come to Jesus Christ. Let him pick you up and Change everything. Turn the tide for you. Your new dawn can begin right now. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2, it said, this is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. So if you are here and you want to surrender your life to Jesus, you want him to take over completely. I'm going to count from one to 10. Before I say 10, come and stand here so that together we can pray and God can save your soul. 
The choice is yours. I've done my own bit. The decision is for you now to make. If you want to give your life to him, come now. As I begin to count, one. Two. Don't wait for anybody. You might be the only one that God is talking to. So come quickly. Three. God bless you. I can see you coming. God bless you. Four. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. The choice is yours. Your new dawn can begin now. Five. Keep clapping. If you are clapping for Jesus, do so. It's not begging you. If you don't want to clap, don't clap. But those of you who are clapping, your hands will never wither. Six. Come, the Lord is calling you. This is your day, your day of salvation. Oh, glory be to God. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. The Lord is calling you. Seven. Be quick, be quick, be quick. I can see some of you see far away. Hurry up. Eight. And if you say you are born again, but you are still living in sin, you are deceiving yourself. So if you are not living a life of holiness, you better come and let the Almighty God give you genuine salvation. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Thank you, Father. Yes, keep coming, keep coming. I wait 10 seconds more. Keep coming. Thank you, Father. Nine. Yeah, you need to run now because I'm about to pray for salvation. Hurry up. Hurry up. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Those of you on the way, you can join us as, as we pray. But you have to hurry up because I'm about to pray for salvation now. Now, those of us who are in front, let's talk to the Almighty God. Say, Lord, have mercy on me. Save my soul. Forgive my sins. I don't want to have anything to do with the devil anymore. I want to do your will from now on. Give me a brand new beginning, Lord. Just save my soul, and I will serve you for the rest of my life. Go ahead, talk to God. And the rest of us, please stretch your hands towards these people and intercede for them. Pray that the one who saved your own soul will save their own souls also. Pray for them, that God will have mercy on them, that he will forgive all their sins. Please pray for them. And if there's anyone see on the way, you have to hurry up now because I'm about to close in prayer. Yes, keep coming. God bless you. You are not too late yet. Just keep coming and praying as you come. Ask Jesus to have mercy on you that you will serve him for the rest of your life. Keep coming. Yes, glory be to God. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. My Father and my God, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your word. And thank you for these people who have responded to the altar call. Please remember your promise that whosoever will come unto you, you will know wise cast out. They've come to you now, Father. Please receive them. Save their souls. Wash them in your blood. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that from this moment onward, you will write their names in the book of life. They will become true children of God. 
and from now on, whenever they cry unto you, answer them by fire. Let it be well with them, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ah, I want to rejoice with those of you who have come forward. I want to promise you like a man of God. So from now on, I'll be praying for you. Very soon you'll be receiving miracles you didn't even ask for. Amen. Then you will know somebody somewhere praying for you. And that somebody is me. That's why I need your names, your address, and your prayer requests. Because when I ask God to send you your miracles, it will be sent to the address you give me. So make sure you give me the correct address. And there are some people on, on my right side there holding up a banner with our CCG counseling team. You follow them, they will quickly take the information I need, and then they bring you back very quickly. You can begin to go. Now. Congratulations. Now, this is where we in Africa, this is where we begin to rejoice. This is, this is the biggest miracle. This is the biggest miracle. Go on, clap. Clap for Jesus Christ. Bless his holy name. Go ahead, praise him. some minutes to pray. Maybe you want to write down your prayer points. Number one, you want to thank the Almighty God that he made it possible for you to be here today. That's the first one. Thanksgiving. That he kept you alive to see this day. Yeah, it means the devil has lost the battle over you. The second prayer point, you're going to say, Father, let my dawn begin today. 